or the package that you have. Um, let me quickly review for you uh, some stuff that's pretty important. And that is, uh, it can look like this. Uh, and we, we, a lot of times, denote this complex number, and this is what this is. A complex number is represented by an imaginary value and a real number. And they put them in this order. And a lot of times they will call this like Z1 and Z2 may be something entirely uh, entirely different or something. That was Z1 and Z2. <coughs> this could actually be Z3. Z3 could be what? Just 5i because the real part of it could be a zero. In other words, this could be what? Zero plus five i. Nobody okay with that? Or it could be z4 could be what? Guess why? Because this could be what? It could be that. So when the imaginary part is zero, then you wind up just a real number, okay? So, just keep this in mind, I'd say that, uh, how many of you remember the operations that you do with complex numbers? How many of you remember working with complex numbers? Vaguely? Uh, um, Well, for, first of all, uh, you're going to have to learn how to add them, right? Add two complex numbers, how to subtract them, how to multiply them, how to divide them. You can actually raise up the powers and do a multitude of things with them. Uh, we'll start off with the easiest of all, and that is what? adding two complex numbers. If I say find the value of Z1 plus Z2, it would be nothing but what? Just A plus I. Does that look okay? Is that, is that not, that was not difficult at all. Just arithmetic involved. Is everybody uh, with me? Uh, if I'm not with me, so here's the catch if you ask to do this subtract them, okay? Here's where you have to be a little careful. And the, the reason I say that is because you need to make sure that when you write the first one down and you say subtract the second one, I would certainly do that to the second one. And by doing this, you, you won't get it wrong simply because you will learn to do what? Change the signs. This is now 5 plus 3i minus 3 plus what? 2i. Is there any questions about adding or subtracting? Now this is just going back and doing what? This becomes 2 plus 5i. Everybody okay with that? Anybody not okay with that? So you now know how easy it is to add them and subtract them. That's fall off a log easy. There shouldn't be any trouble adding or subtracting 
the complex numbers, okay? What about, what about if you had to do this? What if you had to divide two complex numbers together? Anybody remember how to divide them? and bottom by 2 plus 5i. Do you notice that you just have to do it just the opposite of what this is? It has to be. Because the bottom now is going to turn out to be just a number. So this is what? This is multiplication of two binomials opposite of each other. When that occurs, then you only have to multiply the outer ones like that. There's no need to multiply the inner ones because they got to cancel each other out anyway. So now the bottom becomes nothing more than 4 minus 25i squared, which the bottom turns out to be what? Do you see that? Clearly, um, I can say y'all don't see that. I squared is negative one. I squared is negative one. I squared is negative one. So what's the negative one times the negative 25? 25. Plus 25 oh. makes this sense, right? Does everybody see this? Mm -hmm. Now, when you multiply the top, it's a binomial. It is this times this becomes 8. It is now this times this, which is plus 20i. And then it is this times this, which is plus 6i. And this times this is plus 15i squared. This is a negative 15. And this makes a what? Negative 7 plus 26i. So you can actually write this two different ways. You can write it like this, or you could write it like this. No, uh, you had it, the I on the bottom.
So hopefully, if you see how to divide them, then you know how to multiply two of them, because we had to multiply this top one. That's just a multiplication problem. So now you know how to do what? Add them, subtract them, multiply them, and divide them. Are we okay so far? Everybody okay? Yes. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> well, you didn't cover multiplying them. I mean, you didn't review multiplying them. Yeah, I did right here. Yeah. Oh, just the... That's the thing is about that. Okay. That's what you do to multiply them. That's why I did a division first, because that incorporates what? Dividing what you divide by multiplying. Okay. Does that make sense? So you just don't have to do one thing. If you know how to divide, you know how to multiply. So let me ask you a question. Where do they reside? Where do those numbers, where are they located? But if you had to go look for one, where would you go look for one? Where would you go find one? Where do y'all go look for the numbers that you use every day? Of the number line, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Well, where would you look for the complex number? Anybody know? <laughs> Well, they are actually on the complex plane. So we go over to our X and Y plane, and we have to do what? We have to make it into what? A complex plane. Now it's a complex plane. You didn't know that, did you? So you just thought this was a real number plane, say x, y plane. C to 4 plus 3i? 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. There it is. There's where they exist and reside, right there. That is 4 plus 3i. All because that's the complex plane. See, y'all thought it was an X and Y plane, didn't you? Well, it was for a while, but now it's the complex plane. And see, the neat part about this, you all, is this, is it didn't become obvious to some of them until they decided to try to figure out where the heck they are located. And then they said, okay, wow, look at this. That really just makes a lot. That makes a triangle. And because it makes a triangle, guess what it has? It has an angle. This is an angle. That's an angle. And we can calculate that angle. <coughs> Um, where, where is an application of this? Uh, if anybody ever taken a course in physics or electronics or electricity? You know what an electric motor looks like? 
electric motor has something called a phase angle. Right? That's the phase angle. That's where the resistance, the what? The capacitor's failure. The capacitor's failure. What would happen if the capacitor on your electric motor goes out? What happens when a capacitor on your electric motor goes out? You turn the power on and what does the motor do? Nothing. It just sits there humming. Yeah. <clears throat> I save so many people hundreds of dollars because their air conditioner quits in the hottest part of the summer. Usually it's a pretty simple fix. It's very easy to determine what's wrong that the capacitor has gone out on the unit outside. My outside unit's not running, it's just sitting there humming. Well, it's very simple. All you got to do is take a stick and hit the blade and start it turning. And if it runs, then guess what's wrong? The capacitor is gone. The capacitor is that unit that really operates at 90 degrees with the phase angle of the motor. So once this power, this power is released from the capacitor, it does what? It gives the motor that initial turn to do what? To keep it from sitting there going buzzing and humming simply because you have to get it to do what? Somebody has to get it started. That capacitor sits there and goes it pushes it around. Another application of the capacitor is where? You ever driven down the road and it's raining and you turn the windshield wipers on? And they go back and forth, back and forth. Then it stops raining and you went to your wipers, you decide to turn them off, right? And you turn them off. <laughs> Is that what happens? No. No, oh, what do they do? Stop and your windshield. What do they do? Stop. They go back to the rest position. Don't they? The old, the old, many, many, many years, the old time it was used to do what? You turn them off, they stop right here. So, so then what did they do? They put a capacitor in line with your circuit and it does what? It's got the power built up, so it does what? It dissipates that power to make it go back into down position. You want to change your windshield wipers? You do what? You turn them on and you turn the switch off to stop them here because you bypass the capacitor by turning the switch off. Y'all know that, right? No? Well, you know it now. So this is all involved in the complex number system with circuitry and an AC motor as the capacitor sitting like this at 90 degrees. That does what? That gives it this twisting motion in a direction to make the motor go spinning. So, anyway, what really became of this was the fact that they found that it had a phase angle. And when, when they realized that, that it had an angle, then they realized they could write those complex numbers in trigonometric form. That was placed them in trigonometry. Because that looked like a lot, a 90 right triangle. And when they put it in trigonometric form, then they were able to come back and a real brilliant mathematician figured out one of the most neat, one of the absolute neatest things in the world, and that was he figured out a way to write it from trigonometric form to exponential form. What an incredible leap in mathematics. I can say this, that every single time I look at that leap that he made, I get chills because it is so awesome to just look at him. And all I can do is just wonder, wow, what, what a beautiful way to describe something. And would I, would I have been clever enough if I had never seen this, 
Would I be clever enough to figure that out? Sadly, the answer always comes back as no. <laughs> I'm not that clever of a person. I wish it would one day say, yeah, you would have you would have seen that. <laughs> but it's never done that for me. But it's one of the most clever things in math of all of math, I think. Who's that? that? He, Who is that? Leonard Euler. Euler? Euler. E-U-L-E-R. Mm-hmm. Pronounced Euler. He was only about 16 years old uh, when he did stuff like that. So. He was getting pretty old, about 19, when he... <laughs> they do not know. They absolutely have no idea how he wrote and published so much work. Now today, with the computer that you have, and research that you have, and all the things that the type in the word, all the stuff you can imagine, nobody today, even at today's pace of technology, couldn't possibly write and publish as much as he did in his lifetime. They still puzzled over the fact that how did he do this? Did he have more time than 24 hours in a day that we don't have? I don't know. Nobody knows the answer. It's just an incredible feat. Uh, thousands of more publications than the closest person to it. And he discovered the most famous number in all the mathematics. And you all saw this the other day, right? What? Right? Remember I showed you all this the other day? And it's named after him. What is that? Sometimes you may be asked to do something like this. What in the world do you get when you raise I to the 193rd power? Anybody remember how to do that? Holly, how do you do that? Remember? Ain't there only like three or four answers that they can make this in? Oh, divide by four. Like negative one. Ah, got the folks here remembered. Ah, a tickle. This is all you have to remember, everybody. I to the zero power is what? What? Anything to the zero power is what? I to the first power is equal to I. I to the second power is equal to what? One, negative, one. negative one. Why is that? Why is I squared equal to negative one? Because Why is I squared equal to negative one? What? Square of two groups. Square of two groups. What do you say? Square of two groups. Y'all, y'all know what that means? No. I damn sure don't. Uh, whatever you say, I don't know. Uh, it's because of this, everybody. I is equal to what? Square root of negative one. Remember that? So if I squared both sides, this becomes what? That. Is that everybody? So, this i to the third is equal to i squared times i. You agree? So this becomes what? Negative i. 
I to the fourth equals I squared times I squared, which is what? Which is what? All over again. All over again, it starts repeat. So, I to any power will be one of these four right there. One of those four. Can't be anything other than one of those four answers. Do you see that? Because it does what? It starts repeating at four. It goes one. I to the fifth is I. I to the sixth is minus one. I to the seventh is minus I. And it can, you all see it just keeps repeating. It keeps repeating this one here. So we then do what? We just take a piece of paper and a pencil and you take 193 and divide this by four. Why by four? Because the answer has to be one of those four over there. So uh, four times four is 16 and then 33. Four eighths is what? 32 with one left over. So this is the same thing as I to the one power. Do you see that? Which is I. Anybody not see that? Everybody okay with that? Any questions about the complex numbers to this point? So, in essence, we have to stop at this point because to make this go in a different direction, we would have to say, okay, how do we do this? What if we take a complex number, 3 plus 2i, <laughs> wow, how much time you got left this week? Because <laughs> we could make that up to the 18th power, right? 38th power, 80th power. Anybody feel like multiplying that out 80 times? No. Uh, not me. So, the reason why we stop at this point, now we will get, you will get this later in this semester, okay? Because, let's just suppose for a second that we did do this. This was 3. This was three, all right? And this was two. You guess everybody? Because this is the I, and this is the Y. This is the real numbers here. Real numbers along here, and the I values along here. It clearly, as you can see, this actually makes a what? A 90 right triangle. Does everybody see that? Now. Let's suppose we did this. Let's, let's make this this instead, make it a little bit easier. Let's make this three, and let's make this four, and we will make that special 90 right triangle and make that one. Remember the three, four, five? That's the real special one, because why? Because that is the only time that the three numbers will come in sequence is the three, four, five, 90 right triangle. Okay, the three, four, five. It, but if you, what if you didn't? What if you had a three and a two like we had a few minutes ago? You could use Pythagorean theorem. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. What's Pythagorean theorem? A squared, a squared plus B squared is equal C squared, right? Yeah. So well, this squared plus this squared equals to this squared. So if you don't believe that, you can do this. Then. 
3 squared plus 4 squared is equal to what? Does everybody see this 3, 4, 5? See how we get 3, 4, 5 out of this? Just for the law. Pythagorean theorem. Everybody remember the Pythagorean theorem? Pretty much so. No questions about it, right? Okay. Now, to, to give you some idea exactly how simple this is, so what that this is a trigonometric problem? Right? Y'all recognize this is a trigonometric problem simply because there's an angle there called theta. I don't care if you call it theta, I don't care if you call it alpha, beta, call it something. You can call it x if you want to, I don't care. You can call it anything you like, but there is an angle there that it makes, right? And what does it say about this angle? You can easily calculate this angle. Anybody remember how to do it with trigonometry? Anybody at all? What? Yeah, something with sides and cosines. Yeah, what it, what it has to do with is this. It's called ratios, okay? Ratios. Certainly, if I took the ratio of this side divided by this side, in other words, this side divided by this side, I don't care how big of a triangle you get. If that ratio is 4 to 3, and that angle is going to be the same angle. You can also look at this that says, okay, how about the ratio of 4 to 5? Okay, that's quite easy, right? The ratio of 4 to 5. That's just a fraction. So it is. And what is 4 divided by 5? Um, point. Point, point 0.8. Right? Every single triangle you get and you make up, I don't care how big or how small, if you take the opposite side and divide it by the hypotenuse and you get a point eight as a decimal, then that angle will be the same. It will be the same angle. So if that is the case, then I can certainly take this and say, okay, what about point A? But which, which two sides did I use to get point A? I use something called the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse, right? So this is actually the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. A few minutes ago, I got 4 over 3. 4 divided by 3. So this turned out to be the opposite over the adjacent side, which is 4 over 3. Right? Okay. One more. What about the one more ratio? How about the ratio where it is what? 3 over 5. That is the adjacent divided by what? The hypotenuse. Now, you don't have to learn this now. You, you do not have to learn this right now. Okay? But pretty soon, before the semester's over with, we're going to be going into this. So when we do, you will go back and say, wait a minute, I remember talking about this at the beginning of the semester. And you'll be a little bit familiar with what we're talking about. And I won't have to reteach the class all over again to get you back on board. I'll just have to review it to say, okay. But look, look at this, everybody. That, you see this ratio? Do you see this ratio? And do you see this ratio? Guess what they did to those ratios? 
You can guess what they did to them. They named them. <laughs> they actually named those three ratios. The first one, the opposite over the apotheus, they call it the sign S-I-N-E, but it's abbreviated S-I-N. And the ratio over here where it says the adjacent divided by the apotheus, they named it the cosine. And when you see the one where it's the opposite over the what? The adjacent side, they call that the what? The tangent. And it's abbreviated S-I-N-C-O-S and T-A-N. That's just the name of the angle of the name of the ratio. A student came in my office one day and said, I don't need any help in my first part of my trig class, but he said, because I know all about the sin and the cosine. <laughs> Gee, I don't think you do. <laughs> I don't think you do. You come in and call it the sin and the cosine. I don't need any help with the sin and cosine. Yes, you do. You just don't know it. Because that's not what it's called. It's called the what? The sine and the cosine and the tangent. And most people go through their courses or whatever, and that's what they believe is all there is to it. Well, no, it goes beyond that. It really truly goes beyond the sine and the cosine and the tangent. Those are what? The basic ones there. They're absolutely the basic ones that you have to deal with. Okay? You could literally do what? You could flip those upside down and say, okay, whoa, what do you suppose I'm going to call the ratio of, say, this side divided by this side instead of this side divided by this side? Well, guess what? They named it to... They call it the cotangent, the cosecant, and the what? Sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, cotangent. Those are just flipped upside down. Don't worry about those. But even if you're taught that in your classes, then they sort of leave it at that, and students have a tendency to think, well, okay, well, maybe that's all. No. It actually has to... What do you do when you run into a situation like this, folks? Somebody has to run into these situations. There's two telephone poles, and guess what's strung between them? A power line. A power line is strung between those two poles. Now, you tell me what angle those make. Ha! Huh. Guess what? The sine, cosine, tangent is not going to work for you because those are not, what? Right. Ordinary angles, right? Those are sort of those, uh, sort of what? Hyperbolic. Yeah. Hyperbolic angles. Instead of being called the sine and the cosine and the tan, tangent it is what? It is... Cosh, tanch, and cinch. Ah, yes. The cinch, S-I-N-H, is equal to e to the x plus e to the minus x all over 2. Look what, do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? What do you see? There's E again. Of all gosh awful places, guess what crops up again? E. Incredible. Should chew your bones, and if it doesn't chew your bones, then you are not thinking at all about man.
Anyway, so, unlike the days of yesteryear where you were given this arithmetic problem and you had to divide it, and sometimes you may have been given a problem that looks like this, and it says, okay, let's see, wow, I got this situation, I got 119.8764 for this side, and this side over here is 96.3821. Okay, wow. Boy, what a lovely number you've been given. What lovely number you've been given. So here you go. You've got to divide the opposite side, which is what? you got to divide the opposite side by the hypotenuse, which is this number here. And guess what you don't have? A calculator. <laughs> you don't have a calculator. You don't have a calculator. So what must you rely on? A phone. A dial phone. You, you go call somebody up, get the answer. No, you have to rely on what? Something called a slide roof. That's all you had. You had to do this with a slide roof. Do all this arithmetic with a slide roof. Then once you got this number, then you'd have to look up a lot in the trig table book, that particular number. You'd have to go find it as almost as bad as giving somebody, you know, somebody give you the telephone number, tell them you go find out who it belongs to. <laughs> you go down the telephone book. It's a little bit easier than that, but you'd have to go down the trig table book to do what? And you come across this number and get pretty close to it, and then, what the hell is going on over there? Uh, you clicked it off, right? You better damn sure I don't have, this ain't a physics lab, because I'd walk over there and I'd cut that switch off, and you wouldn't have power on your desk. Uh, Y'all need to be listening, okay? I know this is bored as hell to some of you, <laughs> but guess what? You gotta have it. You gotta have this course. I don't have to have it. I just get the job and the fun job of telling you about it if you'll just listen. So anyway, you go and you look. Once you get this, look. There is a. There is. I don't care if it is that number. That makes a Pacific angle. And look what out. Look, take your calculators out right now. How many of you in this room truly know how to do this problem right here? Two. How many of you truly know how to do that? Mathematically. Yeah, I know, right? Huh? I don't know if I should say yes. Did you know how to do that problem? The, the correct way? What do you have to do? Multiply by 2 to get 10. No, you divide 2 by 2. The absolute true way to do this problem, folks, is this, is the inverse of this. Did you realize that? How many of you realize that? That's truly what you're doing. Over here, what is the exponent right there? It's the 1. What is the minus 1 plus the 1? Zero. So what does this become? Right? And this becomes what? 10 over 2. 
Because that's one over two, right? That's how you do it. That's truly how you do it. So you find the inverse. So guess what on your calculator? If you look at your calculator right now, and I want you to look for those buttons that says sine, cosine, tangent. Do you see them? Look what's right above them. What's right above them? What's right above them? Get your calculators out. Where'd you get where'd your calculators? Back at Target. Hey, where? Back at Target. <laughs> Still on the rack. <laughs> I don't have one. I did have one, but someone took it, so I'm... Well, don't. Hell, I wouldn't break one to school. Don't do that. Yeah, someone stole it. God, that was... So that's my other one's at Target. That's what was all in the damn tears here, so... Oh, gee. Okay. If you look above those sine, cosine, and tangent, you will actually see the inverse sine, the inverse cosine, and the inverse tangent. Most of the time when people look at that, they think that's one over sine because something to the minus one power is one over that, right? But that's not it. That's just saying that's the inverse to what you're doing. So if you would actually do this, if you did this right here, if you did this, put this in your calculator right now, and you took this and divided it by this. Do it. Do that. You already got it done? Well, guess what? If you will go inverse sine by hitting the second function right there, there's the angle of that, the answer. Of it. There's the angle. That is the angle. Of that triangle right there. Everybody got error. That's that's pathetic if you did. <laughs> How about this one over here? Look at this one over here. What is this? What is four divided by three? Would you calculate? Or you can actually do this with your calculator because it's got the what? The bulk of you. You could say this. You could say second. That's the tangent, right? Inverse tangent of what? Four divided by three. Close your parentheses. Look at that. Wow, what was that other angle? Can you believe it? I almost made the same triangle by making... I just made these numbers up over here, and both of them turned out to be 53 degrees. You're not getting that. It's pitiful. You got to you got to calculate. It's got it in the wrong mode. Yeah. Put it in the right de degree mode, not radian mode. I don't. Got it? No. You know how to do that? Give it to me. <laughs> you call it mode. You see where it says mode? No, I ain't showing you. <laughs> <laughs> Pass in the degree boat. <laughs> what was that other one? Let's start. I don't know what that other one. That's, write that down. 1.30, right? Oh, how in the world I managed to do that? 96.1. divided by 119.876. Six, four. What? Second, and we did what? Sign, right? Mm -hmm. Of the answer. 53.5 what? About close. Whoa. Yeah, that's scary. Both of them came out to be 53.1 degrees. One of them came out to be 53.5 degrees. So. I just made that up off the top of my head. I didn't mean to make it come out and be the same. Is that the, per the perfect triangle? No. 
I'm saying the, the, two, the ratio there, four to five, is pretty close. Yeah, that's the reason why, because the ratio is pretty close. Um, but anyway, you can see that, like say, it's uh, that this divided by this is about the same as that ratio over there. Now, here's the thing about it, everybody. I think when you did this a minute ago, we got this to be what, 53 degrees approximately, right? About, about 53 degrees. If you did this, you see that everybody? <coughs> That's this. So over three, up four, okay? Are we okay? And we know this is five, right? What about... <laughs> Can you imagine doing this 20 times out? No. <laughs> I wouldn't even want to dream of trying to do this. Debbie, y'all pay attention. I was just having some calculator. This is what? This is actually, to do this problem, you'd actually do this. 5 raised to the 20th power, which you can easily do, times the sine of 53 degrees times 20 plus cosine 53 degrees times 20. I. This should be sine and cosine. This should be cosine. Now, that, you don't have to write this down. Don't write that down, everybody, because that'll come back a little bit later on. But what I'm saying is they, that you, they figured out a very clever way. They figured out a very clever way to raise a complex number to some gosh awful number up here. Just by doing this. Cosine, multiply the angles times 20. Both cases, and then you got the answer. What's 53 times 20? What's 53 times 20? Right there, quick. 53 times 20. Oh, look. Let's take the cosine of that. Cosine of the answer. That's what you get right there. That's what you get when you multiply. That's, that's the number you get right there. Now, we will come back to this as we get more and more over into the course, okay? So, so you, we will come back and see this again. You will see this again. Any questions about complex numbers? Not in considering now that we're doing this, okay? I just showed you, hopefully that sort of soaked in a little bit, how they managed to do something like this, okay? Raising it to the 20th power, okay? Which is a very easy way to do it, provided you know a little bit about the what? How to write it is this. It's cosine and sine, okay? But you have to get the angle first, which we did. We got this at 53 degrees, and we just had to do what? 20 times the 53 degrees in both cases, and one of you take the cosine of, and the other one take the sine of. And then you have to do this, 5 to the 20th power, there'll be some fairly large number, then you multiply this out. And then guess what stays out here? The I stays out there. 
So you wind up with a complex number. Written from what? From trigonometric form back to what? Complex form. Complex number form. You can go from complex number form to trigonometric form, or you can take it from trigonometric form back to what? Complex form. Yes? Can you, can you give me like two seconds? Like, I can't figure out why the cosine's not working. It's working. <laughs> you just stop pushing. <laughs> She wants to know if you'll show it to her on her calculator. I just want you to show it to her. <laughs> boy, oh boy. <laughs> this is what I have a hard time with with this school. Somebody, you shouldn't be allowed to own that calculator. She doesn't. <laughs> she doesn't. Oh, she doesn't own it? Okay. That's yours then, right? Mm -hmm. I see you do it. I see. I was trying to take it after, and then yeah, y'all, y'all, y'all keep me out of this. Uh, <laughs> it is. Like what am I? What are my greatest complaints? I guess about the school. <laughs> and I could retire tomorrow if I wanted to, or today. It didn't matter. I mean, I could do it any time. Uh, but I love what I do. But the only thing I fussed about for quite a number of years, uh, not the whole time I've been here, but at least the last 10 years, is the fact that I walk into a college algebra class or a college trig class or a college pre-calculus class, and I have a tremendous number of students that don't even own a calculator. They don't have a calculator, especially in my college algebra class. How the hell did you ever get in the college algebra class without the calculator? That means you got real smart. Because they would always tell me, well, our teacher didn't let us use one. What teacher didn't allow you to use a calculator should not be allowed to be teaching? Because the course that you took before you got there had to have the word algebra in it. It's called pre-algebra, right? It's called 1013. Algebra, 099, algebra. Intermediate algebra. If it has the word algebra, then you should go drag out calculators on the first day. Otherwise, if you don't know arithmetic, well then get back over there and where? In 097, where you can learn your arithmetic. Don't come drag it into my class without a darn count. And I get so upset. I mean, it, it is. It, it bothers me. I, I've, I've got four classes today. You know, I mean, now, this semester, college algebra classes. Three of them, I mean, not four, but three of them. And lo and behold, guess what? Four of them, actually. A lot of my students still, a whole month has almost gone by, still don't have a calculator. And some of them that do, would you show me what that, where that key is? Uh, no. <laughs> I don't, I will, but I don't want to. Because you should know. And I have to say, I guess my, that's my pet peeve, because I taught, I, taught, I taught at Columbus State for years. And I never once had to walk into the college algebra class and teach someone how to use a calculator. They walk in, every student walked in with a pretty fancy calculator. Guess what? Every single one of them knew how to use it. And that, that's, that's the tip. That just is so enlightening to do that. And I don't have to go stop and say, there's your exponential key right there. You see it? And then I have to walk over here because theirs is not the same location as that one over here. See? Where's your calculator? You gotta have one. Don't. Y'all listen. Gee, you gotta have a calculator. I don't want you to go out there and pay hundreds of dollars for a calculator. All you need is a lot. It's about a. This one, what? 50, less than 15 bucks $10. probably. $10. Ten dollars. Oh my lord. Is that cosine thing on your um, calculator? Is what? 
I didn't hear what she said. She said yes, it it's is, Corey. It is. Yes. Well, there's two of you talking at the same time, so it's sort of hard to understand two of you. <laughs> question. She wanted to know if this is a good enough calculator. Does it have all the... Yeah, yeah. I, I just said. This no, right that's here. not what I, I said. It has a cosine thing on it. I didn't think it was not good enough. No, I meant, oh, yeah. I meant that. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was she wanted to know if cosine and sine and all of that is on there. I'm still trying to figure out. They said it's there. Yes, it's out there. And the one, the thing I like about this one over some of the others is you, the letters are easy to read. They're yellow with the green. Well, yeah, and. I like it when it's got the darker background, like the dark blue with the yellow. That was the best ones of all. I don't know why they didn't leave it at that. Some of them they made a light blue with light blue letters for the second function. Yeah. Gee, hard to see those. And this one, uh, should not be this color. Why do you say this should be this color? Distracting. Why? Distracting. Y'all should know that. It's green on green. Colorblind people have trouble with red and green. Red and green. If a person colorblind looked at it, they say it was a red one. You realize that? It would be red for them. I grew up with a whole family that the whole family was colorblind. Really? Even I didn't know it until I was a teenager. Oh, yeah. And we were teenagers and we I riding down the street with it. And I said, well, you just ran through this red light. He said, I did not. I said, yes, you did. It's red. I've never in my life, entire life, and I knew it was there. Everybody else knew it was there. Never seen one ever again since, but they had a red light in the middle of town that the red light was on the bottom and the green light was on top. You ever seen one of those? It sure was. All my life I grew up in that town and the red light was on the bottom and he ran right through it because when the bottom light comes on, it's green. He knows to go. No, that's to stop, you idiot. It's red. It's green, and we argue back and forth. With us. So, anyway, we got what, a few more minutes. Yeah. I am not that concerned about you knowing about the trigonometric part of it today. Okay? But I but I only wanted you to know that they can be written in what? Trigonometric form. Because look at that over there. That makes an angle. That makes an angle. I don't care how you draw them out there, they make an angle. So if they make an angle, then well, trigonometry's gotta be involved, right? So, but I do hope you remember the four things there that I, zero is one, two, it's actually one minus I minus uh, one, I plus one. And it just rolls over and over again from that remainder will always be Either a what? Your remainder will always be a zero 